cars hit each other. It's a real-time system and it has safety constraints and it's one we use every day, but we don't really think much about it as being safety critical in a computer we're interacting with. The type of system our Tims works with usually do not have anything like a keyboard or a mouse or a graphics display. They have analogs and discrete IOs and uh, usually kind of strange custom devices. Um, a lot of people build FPGA devices that end up interfacing with things like gamma ray burst detectors or other odd things. But there are various types of sensors um, that are, you wouldn't normally think of having an embedded system. But on the other hand, we do have a lot of standard things. We have um, uh, a FreeBSD TCP IP stack, so we have a lot of routers and network filters type products. We have a lot of control systems that have network interfaces, um, a lot of consumer electronic type products. Uh, that, but the idea is that it's not a normal computer system. These are usually um, collections of unique hardware that's put together with a processor that's not out of the, it could be an ARM, but normally there's, we support about 18 architectures because people select different architectures for different reasons. I mean, for example, the ARM at this point does not have a space-hardened version. So the ARM is only being flown on mostly CubeSats in low Earth orbit. So there's a, a hardened power PC, a hardened, a few hardened sparks, a uh, hardened coal fire, which is a 68,000 derivative, and a couple of others. And that's pretty much what the whole space community flies. But when you start looking at this, and Linux is no different than this, when you really back off, the old school definition of an operating system is just a collection of software services and abstraction layers that basically allow you to focus on the job of what your application is doing rather than focusing on devices so you can move code around. That's all an operating system is. And this is why you have application portability. So in the old days, it was actually, well, in Tron, it was called a master control program. And the class of operating system we deal with, these were actually, in the <coughs> old days, called executives because all they did was manage a set of threads. And when you start adding file systems and uh, network stacks, then they became more of an operating system. So the important thing about being real-time is that you want to have other services and frameworks which help you um, meet application requirements at that time. So instead of saying, uh, let's think of an example, um, uh, a fire alarm. A fire alarm has so long from when the temperature reaches a certain level or the smoke is detected before an alarm is generated, and there is, there's going to be a timing path along that. It's not just enough to generate the signal, there's going to be timing requirements. So these often interact with each other. There may be minimums. Uh, lots of times you deal with things like uh, electrical switches and mechanical switches, which have delays in, excuse me, minimum times in between two. You can't close a light switch but uh, every so often. It has a minimum inner arrival time. But the focus is on predictability. And predictability is a key word that you hear a lot Robustness is a key, another key word. Robustness gets tied in with program correction and uh, program proof. But you don't want algorithms that are order in because then you can't predict how long they're going to take to execute. You don't want algorithms, if you can avoid them, that are even uh, log to in. You want algorithms that execute in fixed time. And on us, for the most part, point, most of the RTMs algorithms internally do execute in fixed time. We do all skip, all thread blocking and unblocking in actually fixed number of instructions on each architecture. The other thing that makes real-time embedded systems unique is not only the timing requirements, but you start getting into size, weight, and power. Um, a Pebble watch is an embedded system that has very unique size, weight, and power. A satellite has um, size, weight, and power. Um, the hardware we always deal with is usually one of a kind. It's a collection of some commercial parts with some custom parts. Uh, safety and reliability, of course, are concerns. Cars are full of systems where you want them to be 100% reliable and safe. The other thing that I always want people to remember is you're interacting with the real world. So it's often hard to debug because you can't set a fire to test a fire alarm. You have to come up with a way to test a fire alarm without burning something down. I worked on a system with a two-ton rotating platform. So when we tested operating it, we actually had to have a safety zone 
and a safety <laughs> op operator to kill it in case something went wrong, which it did a couple of times in the early development. It, uh, the high energy physics people often worry about high voltage and, and getting killed. So your user interface, I mean, like even a, 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 petrol, a petrol pump, it's got an oddball user interface. That's um, an oddball one that's not standard. And they interact with the, with the, the real environment. So there's lots of examples of these. So RTIMS is designed for what I call deeply embedded systems, and this has become more pronounced as you start to see things like Linux move into areas more like set-top boxes, entertainment centers, um, air track, uh, not air traffic control management systems as much as um, the in-flight entertainment systems, which seem to be so unreliable. But things like, notice that there's a real focus on full-time operation and correctness. Medical devices down there have to go through serious uh, regulatory control. Uh, our TIMS is used in some industrial power control systems and monitoring systems that are at what we in the U.S. call substations, the large substations where power is distributed. Those have extremely high rigorous uh, regulation requirements. So that's kind of the environment in which our TIMS plays. And I'm hoping that the slide that I want is up here in a minute. So our TIMS is designed to be deterministic embedded operating system, very conscious of, and are predictable on our execution time and our resource uses. We are free in the sense that uh, we do not place any restrictions on anybody who links with us, which I think y'all pretty much follow the same type of license. You don't care what anybody does. It's a BSD style license. Even if everything is not BSD style, you're not going to get any obligations when you link with the code because nobody is ever going to use field and embedded system which requires you to ship a kit of source for your medical device. You're just never going to ship it. Nobody's going to meet the GPL if you shipped a heart monitor with, a, with the GPL. Um, R10 supports POSIX, um, various file networking standards, sockets, JFFS2 for file system, DOS file system. We actually support 18 processor architectures and have about 175 uh, boards that we run on. We're pretty open and the reason uh, as a community, one of the things that's happened as a result of GSOC is uh, most of our hosting is moving to Oregon State's open source lab. And the reason I'm actually here is because I'm going out to ESA and doing some training later in the week. This is the slide I wanted. This kind of helps you see where we fit into the space, into the operating system spectrum. And it's really hard to do this without three dimensions because you can't, you don't get into hypervisors unless you get the third dimension. So the distinction here is operating systems that are, have a strictly real-time focus versus have a light, they have some real-time focus, and I was hoping Linux would migrate to that box someday. <laughs> but Linux is kind of in this general community that's POSIX process model, and then Windows is out here in its own land. When you come over to real-time, Lynx OS is a is a small embedded Unix that feels a lot like Linux. There's an avionics standard called A-Ring 653, and pretty much every time you get on an airplane, you're flying an A-Ring operating system. These are very expensive, um, 80 to 120,000 euro a seat um, licenses. And then you get into, there's probably 100 single process multi-threaded OSs, but those are probably the biggest four. And uh, we usually compete against VxWorks when we're compared or ThreadWorks, uh, ThreadX. VxWorks is now owned by Intel. So it's kind of interesting to see how things have changed. So I think I've said all that. We can go down as, as small as 16K on an ARM thumb. We try really hard to give you an extremely large number of configuration features and a lot's left out by the linker. So I've said we're single process, multi-threaded. We also have, which nobody probably knows, cares where it came from, but we have something called a classic API, which is geared toward really, truly hard real-time systems where the POSIX threads came from an environment focused on workstation. Uh, multiple file systems. I'm proud to say that uh, we now have a functioning port of the FreeBSD 9 TCP IP stack and USB stack that's working great with IPv4 and v6. Um, apparently uses too many locks and it needs optimization from our standpoint, but that's a different problem. 
We do removable mass storage, which means in our world, that means you can use this for a data logger with, an X, with a USB device, take, run the FAT file system or something on it, take the device off, take it off and analyze it somewhere else. So as a data logger, it's really good. We have something that looks a lot like a simple busy box shell with about 100 commands, a lot of which came from uh, the BSD land, along with things to look at the system. If you've ever used a router or some other product where you could like telnet into the dedicated box and run commands on it, it's geared toward generating that where you've got a custom little interface to do things, to do uh, device maintenance and setup. But where a lot of our focus has been lately is, um, well, we've always had, if you study much real time, you'll know about the priority inversion problem, which is where a high priority uh, task has, or thread has to wait on a low priority thread, which is holding a resource. And there are two protocols, the inheritance and the ceiling protocol, to help you deal with that. We've supported those since nearly the very beginning. We keep a lot of statistics on how much stack you're using, your CPU usage, and we do rate monotonic scheduling for strictly periodic tasks. So if something has to execute every 20 milliseconds, you can set it up as a special period oriented task, and we will track how much CPU time and how much uh, wall time it used on each iteration. So you can see if you're using 19 milliseconds on average of a 20 milliseconds period, which you know is bad because that means you're really, really close to the edge of not meeting your, your system requirement. But um, we've been doing a lot of work on symmetric multiprocessing. And at this point in our, in the, in our OS space, I think we're pretty much at the, uh, in, or in the lead. Um, because of the space community, we support the Spark on the Leon 3 and uh, what's called the next generation microprocessor. We have ARM, uh, x86, and then PowerPC on Q or IQ. Uh, we also have an older um, asynchronous slash distributed multiprocessing that used RPC, which was more based on a distributed shared memory model. The, just to throw this out, based on the version, you get a yes, no, and then you get lots of architectures. Notice this ends at M for MIPS, which means that there's still more M's, and it comes over and hits architectures that you've probably never heard of. Um, this is an open source processor. Uh, these are older J Japanese processors. The, uh, this is the V9 Spark, an old DSP, and that's an automotive processor from NEC. That, um, there's your kind of block view of the operating system. The important thing looking at the operating system is what's unique about this environment. Remember I said everybody we deal with deals on a, um, as we have to assume they have their own hardware, which means that we have to assume they're going to put together their own unique board support package. So we have to look at a piece of hardware as a set of components, and the component is partially made out of um, the processor architecture. So is it an ARM? Is it a PowerPC? Is it a Spark? Then we look over here and go, okay, we knew, we knew what it was as an architecture, but which ARM is it? I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of ARM processor models with different peripherals on them. The peripherals generally live in either the shared area for board support package or an oriented lib CPU. I think as we move to a new build system, this will fold into here. And this probably will too. These are peripheral chips like UARTs that are very common and you see across all architectures. But at some point, you look at these as your base of reusable software. I should mention, this also has the framework that every BSP has to follow. You have to put in your, your own specific information, like uh, what's your address map? What address did you put the peripherals at? Did, when you put your system on chip together, if you assume it's a custom one, did you put three UARTs, four UART, UARTs, two, net, two network controllers, zero network controllers? And there's a lot of information in here that's board specific. And um, one of the strange things that I, I don't, if you haven't looked at these type of boards, you wouldn't have noticed. A lot of the embedded ARM and PowerPC boards look really good when you read the specs. And then when you look at them really close, you can't use all the peripherals at the same time. So there are I.O. and feature configuration flags. So if you get the board from one vendor, 
uh, you'll see one set of settings for those. You get the same chip on a different board and you'll get another set of settings for those registers. Those are the tiny details that often are in this board specific part. Some of these boards uh, specific parts of the BSP are only a half dozen files. The part that's shared all the time, first you've got the architecture, like I said, Spark, PowerPC, MIPS, and then you have these basic, what we call super core, and this is, a, a, unfortunately, our naming was really bad, probably still is. The joke here was that the trend in operating system design at the time was microkernel, and we weren't doing a microkernel. We were doing something that was more akin to an object-oriented threading library where the super core implemented textbook computer science concepts and did all of them. So if you've seen any feature in a mutex, it's in here. And our idea was that when you went up here to look at these standards, you would see an API like uh, pthread mutex, which my recollection is it has priority ceiling but doesn't have priority inheritance or vice versa. So you only get certain features out of certain, certain APIs. Uh, the message queue here, um, you can't block uh, when you send if the queue is full. In POSIX, you can block when the message queue is full. POSIX also has message priorities. So the message queue um, class at this layer actually supports both of those. So it's just a personality or a facade, whatever the pat pattern name is these, these days. The, so the classic API is what was implemented first. The POSIX API is about 90% of the standard open group single unit specification 1013 1B. And this is actually a joke in English. So do you know the English word sap, which comes out of a tree, which is sticky? Sappy. These are the parts of the operating system that everybody, every operating system has. No standard's going to ever go near them because they're too sticky to discuss. Nobody's ever going to discuss how you configure an operating system, how you initialize it. Loosely, there's a device driver framework that always looks alike but is always different. So the, how do you put plug-ins for extensions? They're sappy. They're sticky. We all know we have them. They're all different. And we're never going to standardize. So that's, that's a bad joke. There's an API for monitoring threads, use stack utilization. And then there's the shell, various file systems. We support GNU ADA, uh, remote debugging through GNU ADA. We have uh, a graphics toolkit. There are some graphics applications. That would be because I'm on battery, wouldn't it? Um, there, are, there are some graphics applications, and we have some frameworks uh, built on these. Micro Windows effectively implements um, the Win32 API for embedded systems, and you, get a, you can actually play Minesweeper on Arkins if you use that. In the graphics toolkit, it also build, live, includes live JPEG, PNG, TIFF, type, Adobe Type 1 flop, uh, fonts, and free type. This, there's a lot of libraries that port to RTIMS. Uh, Python runs fine on RTIMS. The cameras that monitor the Sydney Bay Harbor off the bridge run Python. And since you know who lives in Sydney, you know who wrote that code. And you, so now you know why he's a big Python fan, among other things. Um, we run we have run for about 15 years a standard BSD TCPIP stack. And I know we've talked a lot about how we how not to do it. The original stack was a great example of how not to do it. The new port is uh, we implemented the bottom layer of the BSD kernels. I think you guys took a similar kind of approach. Has a has a, a, some APIs that they kind of agree to for kernel for threads and mute synchronization and timers and interrupts. Well, we implemented their APIs. We actually, and so we are actually basically cut the bottom out of the BSD kernel and run the drivers on top of their API on top of our operating system. So we're, we are actually running pretty much an unmodified FreeBSD 9.3 TCPIP stack and USB stack. So the idea, one of the ideas of our tips philosophically is that <coughs> this has to be done for each application. There are only so many of these architectures, but you want everything to be the same as much as possible up through here. And if you notice, these are all pretty standard packages. We try to have as much POSIX support as it possibly makes sense. We have a lot of BSD support. 
So it's easy to port any kind of open source package that will run within the assumptions that we, that we have, which is, again, multi-threaded, single process. And we've got all of the communication objects, including some that people don't use very often, like barriers. And the other thing that we have that's kind of unique is since when you build an Artsens application, you're building one process with multiple threads, we actually let you select your scheduling algorithm when you configure your application. So most people are going to use a simple priority based, but um, you can use other algorithms. And this is our uh, thread state model, which is not that exciting. that exciting. Threads start out, they don't exist. Because of the original API, there is a distinction between creating and starting a thread. And P threads, those are the same operation. Once a thread is ready, it can be dispatched to be executing. This is the version with the typo. It can, be, it can yield or preempt. I fixed that in the version I was going to present today. So we'll see if the other typo is still in here. So you, once you're executing, you either can voluntarily yield the processor or you can be preempted by something that's more important. We have a concept called suspend and resume. And if you're blocked, you can be un, uh, resumed. Anytime you're ready, if you're, the scheduler determines you should execute, then you will become the executing thread. And you can voluntarily block or suspend. So the focus in the design of RTIMS is very thread oriented. And at any given time, a single um, action or state change happens to a thread at a single time. So what happens? You're executing and you voluntarily yield the processor. <laughs> You're executing and you block waiting on a mutex. All of these things in, are only one action or one decision point for the scheduler. Obviously, you can be deleted. This goes through the states. Usually, it's just a check to make sure I've said the right thing. Um, we track the executing thread. The other neat thing about RTEMS is it's linked in with your application. There's no separation between kernel and user space. The whole processor is, is available because you're one process on the, on the uh, your one POSIX process on the processor. So on a single core system, there's only one thread running at any given time. And inside the OS, there's uh, a variable called thread executing, which is now a macro because of the SMP. The neat thing is you can always trace them because you build RTEMS as part of, you build it as a library and link it with your application, which means you can step into it. So as we did the SMP work, we didn't redesign our TIMS, but we really rethought it, refactored it, and restructured a lot of the way the thread stuff was done. And one of the things that came out of that is, what does our TIMS do? It really just manages sets of threads. There's a thread, set of threads executing. There's a set of threads waiting, ready to execute. There are multiple sets waiting on resources. So and you can change on a per thread basis your priority and actually whether you're preemptible or not. So in most environments, your thread's always preemptible. In our tips on a single core system, you can say you're not preemptive. So this is the overarching uh, thread set view we've gone to with the symmetric multiprocessing. At any given time, there is a set of uh, executing threads. And the unit processor system that is only one set of one thread. But in a symmetric multiprocessing system, the big change is now there's obviously are going to be one on each core. And that has implications for application correctness. There's also a set of ready threads. It's the same set. And actually, all the scheduler does is manage this set of threads. So he decides when it's time to dispatch and change the set that's executing. And the, other, the final thing is that at any given time, you have an arbitrary number of mutexes, message queues. You can wait on time with delays or until a particular, uh, like midnight. And this didn't change for, multi, uh, for uh, multi-core. So what we've changed with multi-core is you can have more threads running. Because you can have more than one um, thread run at the same time and you have more than one processor resource to allocate to, you need different scheduling algorithms because most of the historic algorithms 
only know how to schedule one core. So you go into a whole different class of scheduling algorithm. So you want to be able to swap them in and out. The other thing about symmetric multiprocessing scheduling algorithms is that it's still an open research topic, which is an even stronger reason to have a plug-in architecture because no matter what you do today, it's wrong. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go, go down to the mat saying I know what the perfect algorithm is because I don't. So here's our scheduling me uh, mechanisms. And those are pretty straightforward. Manual round robin is how old Windows and uh, Mac OS is. It's real handy lots of times in um, real embedded systems just to cycle through a, a set of activities. Rate monotonic is pretty much a topic by itself. It's a way to schedule periodic tasks and guarantee that your task set is schedulable. We have up to 256 levels of priority. Um, each API defines which, whether numeric high or low is, is the most important. But the important thing is you get to change it on a per thread basis and this is, it's important how you do it because these priorities are supposed to reflect what's important in the external world. So um, in rate monotonic scheduling, the activity that happens the most frequently is the highest, should be the highest priority. Preemption allows tasks, uh, says when you're executing something more important than you can give up the, um, pro can take the processor away. So if I'm running and Ben is woken up, Ben's more important, so he would run. It's that simple. But if uh, Dr. Tannenbaum came in, he would preempt Andy, I mean, sorry, he would preempt Ben, but if Ben had the priority inversion problem is if Ben is holding something Dr. Tannenbaum wants and Ben won't give it back until he's done. That's the priority inversion problem in a nutshell. So time slicing is based is limits the length of time a task runs before it's evaluated to be um, executed again. There's a subtle difference between the way classic API and POSIX API handles when the processor um, thread when the time quantum is reallocated. So basically, if you're not preemptible, then you can't be time sliced because it's implicit that you're going to give up the processor. So time slicing just uses the clock tick to round robin tasks as necessary. But as I mentioned, manual round robin allows you to go through a task, set a task manually and it allows you complete and utter control. If you run for a long time and don't yield the processor, you run for a long time, and that's why Windows 3.x uh, would, would get an hourglass forever. Rate monotonic is, um, let's see, it's based on periods, faster the period, shorter the period, the higher priority it is, and, and it's a thread set said to be schedulable if they all meet their deadlines. Most of the schedulers in our TIMS are priority based and the goal of the scheduler is to guarantee that the highest priority ready task executes. And this is normally the only type of scheduler, the only class of scheduler you'll see in, in uh, practical use. So it's your job to assign priority in a way that the ready task that you want to execute is allocated to the processor. So this priority goes into account with preemption and time slicing. So the time slicing cycles through tasks of equal priority. If you are not preemptible, even if you're not the highest priority task, you can continue to run, which can lead again to cases of priority inversion, but it's a simple way to do uh, mutual exclusion on a single processor system. The other neat thing about going to a schedule, a pluggable schedule algorithm pluggable scheduler algorithm is that um, we actually got to, we finally had to name the scheduling algorithm we had had for over 15 years. And it's now called the deterministic priority scheduler. This is pretty close to a textbook algorithm. There is an array of linked lists, one list per priority. Uh, the lowest index list with a task on it at the front of that list is the highest priority task that's ready to execute. And we keep a bitmap of priorities which have one or more ready tasks. And it's um, really optimized for fixed time execution. It only takes a couple of bit scans, a couple of loads, and some shifts, and you can find the highest priority ready task. And if anybody's ever seen this before, you will, 
can you'll re somebody will know why the uh, no maximum number of priorities in Windows, like NT and above, and on and VMS was 32, because they had 32 bit bit scan. We do a double level bit scan to get so two 16 bit bit scans. 16 times 16 is 256 to do the trick. So this isn't. <coughs> This is kind of a twist on an old school algorithm. We use um, the top nibble of the priority to put you into what we call a major. So there's a 16 bit major bit map. And if that bit is set, so if bit 7 is set, that indicates that there are threads ready between priority 112 and 127. And we know we have to come over into the minor bit map to see the bit, which indicates which specific priorities have tasks on them. So there's a bit, so that's why I say there's a bit scan, an indexing and a load, another bit scan, and then you shift, uh, you shift and a work. And then you've got the, the, the num highest priority. So here's an example. Um, when you initialize almost any of the default RTIMS configurations without too much tinkering, you'll end up with a thread at priority one and a thread at priority 255. 255 is the idle thread, and priority one is, unless you change the default, is an initialization thread. So uh, that shows you the major and the minor. And the major is got a bit set at each end. That would be priority one. That would be priority 255. The interesting thing, deep in the, when you port, this is kind of a um, logical representation. Sometimes you get, uh, find the first zero set. Sometimes you get it from left or right. So the port's responsibility is to find the right instruction and make it look like, and present the, this concept up a level. So you can scan for zeros from left or right as long as you make it look like zero and 15 coming out. Because I think the power PC even numbers the bit opposite of every, the way everybody else does. I think what most people would consider bit 31 the most significant bit, I think they call bit zero. Now, that's the scheduler that everybody has used. It's flying on every mission that's flown. But to prove we could have a pluggable interface, the second algorithm that was implemented is the one that's in every textbook, which is a simple, straight, sorted list of tasks. And it's really simple, has the same behavior, it's terribly not deterministic, but it doesn't use much memory. And the cool thing is, this is engineering. This is not theoretical computer science sometimes. If you have a low-end system, it probably only has four or five tasks in it. And it doesn't matter how, what algorithm you use if you only have four or five of something. The algorithm only becomes important when you have tens or hundreds of something. So if you've only, if you've only got a processor that's capable of an application with six tasks, it's not going to take you long to put them on a linked list. So that's the trade-off. You save three or four K of memory and you got it. We have, has anybody ever seen earliest deadline first? It's, so this is an implementation of the earliest deadline first. It's based on our rate monotonic periods. So you set up a task that runs on a period and its period, its next period is its deadline and that's used as the deadline. Um, so the start of the next period is the deadline. So logically, we have two bands of tasks, the periodic, deadline-oriented, and the ones that aren't. So the ones with deadlines are always run before the ones without deadlines. And that's a pretty standard way to design a system uh, in, on, in paper. I don't know if this algorithm has actually been used in a, in a field at RTIM system. This is similar to the same algorithm in, in Linux, a uh, constant bandwidth server. It's basically the earliest deadline um, First scheduler extended, so now you know a per CPU budget, and when the budget's exceeded, the callback's invoked. One of the cool things that um, this algorithm does is that it does what you do. You get to Christmas Eve, the stores are all closed, and you decide, it doesn't matter what I do, I can't shop for everyone, I quit. And then you just start drinking at 2 o'clock because you know you can't finish your shopping before <laughs> 6 anyway. Yeah, that's, exactly that's what the scheduling algorithm does. Really it, does. It, it knows when it's pointless to try, so it just gives up and continues. If you're not going to make your deadline anyway, why care, right? 
Then we get into the SMP scheduling algorithm. I should also say it sends off an alert, which you probably don't do in this Christmas. You kind of slither away in shame on the mm -hmm. Christmas and present example. <laughs> the simple <laughs> scheduler algorithm. <laughs> the simple SMP scheduler algorithm was the first one uh, SMP algorithm we had. And the idea was just to take the simple um, <coughs> single core algorithm and extend it to multi cores. And the irony of this is that by the time it was done, it was no longer a simple algorithm. It was quite a complicated algorithm, but it still used a linear length list. So there is um, so um, the deterministic priority scheduler has now been extended to multiple cores, so now we do have the deterministic scheduler. So how does all this work? Basically, there's a dozen to 15 um, system points at which a scheduler callback is. A scheduler is nothing but a set of functions which are invoked at particular times in the life of the system based on particular events, and that lists some of them out. When you build an RTINS application, you specify um, lots of things, like what file systems do you want? Do you want a file system? How many, do you, what's the maximum number of threads you want? What's the maximum number of uh, barriers? And lots of things default to zero. So the scheduler is just one of the parameters that's uh, included. So you basically get to pick the algorithm that meets your time and uh, memory requirements and your scheduling algorithm behavior. So you also can provide your own scheduler without modifying RTEM source. So at system initialization, it's invoked. When a thread is out, is created or deleted, um, the scheduler is allowed to have some little bookkeeping information. He's invoked when the thread yields the processor. When a thread is blocked, is a, like when it can't get a resource, or is blocking for time. When it's unblocked, um, an extract is what happens. Like say you're uh, waiting for a mutex and you have a timeout of a second and you don't get it. You're automatically extracted from the blocking operation. You didn't get the resource. You're arbitrarily anywhere in the blocking set. Um, some of the schedulers cache information, pre-compute pointers, um, indexes on the major miners. So you, if you change the um, priority or some of the execution modes, the scheduler gets invoked to pre-compute things. And then the massive schedule, which sometimes is very simple. Sometimes is if you, some of the, the better, the deterministic algorithms tend to do small actions when you block or unblock or extract. The simpler algorithms tend to go out and, and half evaluate the world in the schedule operation. So it's a matter of whether you're doing things a little bit at a time as you know little bits and things are changing, or whether you make a big global um, look over the system. And then you have to enqueue a thread where it goes into its priority group. And there actually is a case, one case I think in POSIX, where you actually are required to go to the head of your priority group instead of the rear which is kind of an abnormal thing to do, in, but it, it's required. We've realized as we've gone along that um, the actually, it's kind of pedantic at this point. I don't think it really matters. The priority of two threads, the meaning of that is actually dependent on the scheduler. Um, if you're deadline-based schedulers, you can release the job. The clock tick is when uh, time slicing and other actions occur. And then we uh, start, there's a helper with the scheduler can assist you in starting uh, the idle thread. So that's basically what it comes down to. It's a large plug-in framework and, or large 15 or so, and uh, any scheduling algorithm you want to implement. So far, it looks like we've hit the classic scheduling types of algorithms that can fit into there. The other thing Artems has is, um, I don't know how much y'all played with scheduling algorithms. They're very hard to debug because they're very hard to create scenarios and run them on real systems to get repeatable results. So once I realized how hard it was to debug on multi-core systems and create applications of threads that did things in the way you wanted, where you weren't even sure what you really wanted the threads to do anyway or the scheduler to do, I put together a subset of the RTIM shell with enough of RTIMs to run on Unix, where you basically write very simple scripts which create tasks 
advance the clock tick, have them block on mutex, change priority for an arbitrary number of cores, and then it, there is no, um, it's a, basically a discrete simulation using all of, as all of the relevant OS source. So you can debug new algorithms. The cool thing is, is nobody has the hardware to test all of these scenarios on any number of cores. You just don't have that kind of hardware. And even if you do, it's really hard to debug on multi-core. So it's really deterministic. It doesn't require target hardware. And if your algorithm stinks, you haven't invested a whole lot of, in, of time trying to debug it. Because I can tell you for a fact that it's pretty tough to debug these when they get complicated. The last part of this is um, the challenges we've really seen. So remember, we're in a single address space. A lot of these problems still apply in uh, multi-core Unix or POSIX-based systems and in A-Ring systems. I actually have seen some A-Ring um, S&P presentations that have, have pro uh, even worse predictability problems. The real issue on a lot of these is this very simple thing. Traditionally, in embedded, multi in embedded systems that were multi-threaded, single process address space, you worked under the assumption that when your thread was running, it was the only thing happening. And the only other thing that could happen was an interrupt. So as long as you kept control of the thread, you were perfectly fine. And if you were the highest priority thread in the system, you didn't have to worry about anything. And guess what? <laughs> as we went on, we realized how many bad multi-threaded programming habits that we were just as guilty of having as the next person. So we, the first discussions of how to make our team support SMP rapidly turned into, oh my God, how many times have we violated all of these rules everywhere in the support code? And so this is where when I think as a, as a practicing community outside of the university and writing applications, we're going to see an enormous amount of broken code. The first one is the highest priority task assumption, which I just mentioned. So, multiple cores, you should assume an application thread is executing on each cores, which means you no longer are running by yourself. So, your implicit critical section is violated. My next favorite one is, and you used to be able on a single core, no matter what thread you were, you could disable preemption. And if you didn't allow the operating system to take the processor away from you, you just kept running. Same broken rule. Other things are running at the same time. If you're broken. So, and it, and, you, and I, the sad thing is, I've taught people for 10 years in Artem's classes that this was one of the cheapest ways to disable, to get a critical section. So now I've got to go back and, and say, this only works on a, uni, a uniprocessor system. So this is another bad one. If you disable interrupts, which was the classic thing to do, which is even cheaper than disabling preemption, if you were the thread running and you disabled interrupts, then nothing could happen. Therefore, you could continue to run with a, well, you, for this rule to hold, number one, you'd have to disable all the interrupts on all the other cores, or you have to start doing it with the interrupt controller, or, and you still have other threads executing. So basically what we're down to is um, you really should have been, we all should have been using mutexes or message queues or something. And, and now what you're seeing is, is the trend toward lighter and lighter locks like the atomic stuff that you're seeing in C++ and added to GCC and C language. <coughs> if you look for papers, you'll see um, the aviation community for man flight, especially commercial like the FAA, and I can't remember the, the European equivalent of the FAA. They've done a lot of research on this. And um, there's been some ESA-sponsored research Caching is um, really, really hard to predict on an SMP system because you don't necessarily know what's running. You basically normally have one memory bus and everybody's hitting the memory and everybody's hitting this cache, trying to keep cache coherence going. And so there's a lot of cross contention. <coughs> Somebody at a conference told me they had actually seen a case where it was indeterminate uh, on one architecture uh, what would end up in memory in certain cases. <coughs> this is a really hard problem. The 
part, assuming the cache coherence really works, the real problem is, is that the two co multi cores can basically uh, rip each other, fight for half the cache age each. So where you used to would have run code, it would have completely fit in the cache, and you would run fine. Now somebody else is chewing up half the cache, or now a third of the cache, or a fourth of the cache. <coughs> or if you get into more complicated two-level designs, you spin on memory, and now you lock the cache coherence to do the atomic lock with another processor, and you're chewing him up from even updating it. So there's lots of caching issues that are very subtle and hard. So since when I did this uh, last <coughs> time was that I thought it was good to end with, well, what, are we, what would really help us? Um, really practical scheduling algorithms. A lot. I remember when I was uh, in uh, grad school, distributed OSs were all the rage, and every algorithm started with the assumption global state information, which is impossible in a distributed system, and then they would run an order in cubed algorithm. Okay, that's just not practical in the real world. <coughs> you can't you can't run in cubed algorithms and meet millisecond delays. I mean, millisecond uh, sub millisecond response times. They also have to be predictable and meet the real world implementation constraints. <coughs> There's still really how do we? Um, I really don't know what the best practice is on how to assign threads. To, to separate cores based on application patterns. I've got a couple in mind, and generally they boil down to put all the computation on one core and put all the I.O. on the other core. And because at least that way they're kind of naturally related, your interrupts will tend to migrate toward one processor. <coughs> Chris is big beef, and he'll give you about an hour lecture on it if you ask. The, issue. the debugging age really stinks. Where We've all gotten spoiled with Raspberry Pis and Beagle Bones that have what the $19 tin can JTAG. Chris is dealing with a $15,000 P uh, debugger and no open source cheap alternative for the ARM board he's using. He's looked at, um, I can't remember which Intel chip they're pushing for embedded. It's, I think it's on the order of 10,000 US to get the documentation under NDA to know what the pinout on the chip should do, would do to debug. This is not, so these are real barriers, plus the issue of how do you actually represent what's happening on all these. I mean, the best we've got really is timeline, multi-threaded timelines to look at for debugging. And the classic old problem of debugging embedded systems is that you have to stop some, and uh, you're controlling a train, You've got a train control system, and you stop something in the debugger. The train doesn't stop. It keeps rolling, and it keeps rolling a long, long time. <coughs> and that's the danger of debugging embedded systems. Well, multi-core, if you stop one core, you somehow need to probably stop all the cores. <coughs> and worst case execution analysis is a big issue in embedded systems because uh, you want to feel the system knowing that it, it will always execute and meet its deadlines. Well, if it's if you've got all these cache effects, then the multi then the worst case analysis starts becoming very hard. It's interesting, just as an aside, if you go back, because I didn't do I graduated with my bachelor's in '86. In the late '80s, early '90s, there was I think it was joint. I can't remember which program it was. There was a joint UK, Europe, NATO, US. Uh, fighter. And there was an enormous amount of research on real-time scheduling, caching effects. And a lot of this is coming back except with multi-core on the end of it. So at that time you were starting to get like seven stage PowerPC processors. And some of the, one of the papers I remember from either University of York or Carnegie Mellon basically ended with all of this makes it impossible to do worst case analysis. You need to disable it and get back to simple processors. Well, we just jumped up an order or two in complexity. So, SMP is really just now being considered for safety critical systems. Um, I know the A rank committee for who does manned flight stuff standards for commercial aviation is discussing SMP for the next version of the standard. And a lot of it comes down to we're not going to do things on two cores at the same time, or we're 
you're going to have to manually schedule the cores, which is kind of a pain. So that's the real fast view of the whole thing, and I think I did it about the same length of time that it was intended to be done, even with all the weirdness. So that covers a lot of territory, but we're we're open open to questions and anything. So where does the drive come to? From for doing that? Where does it come from? It was simple, nice, easy. Why? 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 Well, be. <laughs> why? Because. Um, <coughs> SM, you to keep a, a fanless process commercially embedded, you usually don't want a fan processor and you don't want a high heat processor, which means you tend to focus the SMP keeps your clock rate and your heat and your power lower, but still gives you the natural concurrency and the throughput you need. The other side of that is, and where we got our initial funding to do some of this, Space processors are built slow. The the Sparks I mentioned, the ERC32 that flies on probably most still most missions, I think tops out at 25 megahertz. So these are, these are on old processes. The Leon 3, which is the current state of the art, and the uh, Rad 750 PowerPC. I think the Rad 750 will go to 133 megahertz. The Leon 3 is in the same range of 100. The next generation is trying to go to 300 or 400 megahertz. And if that's all you can do and stay in the processes you have to do to be space hardened, you're better off going multi-core because you can't raise the clock rate. They also, there is There's some belief that you can you disable, can disable unused, unused cores, cores and save power, power, although I, the Leon designers say that's not true for them, and um, I talked to some guys from one of the A-Ring vendors, and they had measured it on the PowerPC, and that wasn't true either. So, and our lab, we did, we're doing some work now, and we had actually proposed turning off cores as, an act, as a feature that would be useful, and we actually went back and backpedaled and said, well, it sounds good, but it's really not right. Because nothing, because we could do all the software and it wouldn't save you any power. So let's find a feature that actually is is meaningful and useful. So it really comes down to the same things you see in, in a phone, except the clock rate can be a little higher. You get better performance by having more cores to do more things in parallel than you do by having a three gigahertz processor in your pants that's going to melt your leg. So, so does it not save power because it's actually not? Substantial part of the power budget is consumed by the, uh, by the cores, or does it really, you know, are there other things that? Could I think it's the heat. It's the heat and the process that space processors have to be made to. Because even even embedded PC systems I've worked on, when you get into uh, systems that have low height requirements or can't have moving fans, you end up having to stay under like a gigahertz to actually be able to be fanless, which why if you need more processing power than say you can get in a gigahertz PC, then your only choice is to go multi-core. And when you add in the restriction that you have to make it on a process that lets you space harden it, you drop your processor another factor of four, so you definitely want second core. The funny thing is they want the performance, but I, I'm, the technical challenges are pretty high at this point. Because the first SMP processors for, for PCs also were not, well, scheduling was not so easy. Right? But, um, no, I mean, uh, I saw your hand off. Because one of the reasons I, I wanted the plug-in scheduling algorithm is the first was my PhD was on real-time disk and cache scheduling algorithms. And I also believe there was no one true algorithm either for a lot. You, if you knew what your system was doing, you could pick a better algorithm. So I like having... These embedded systems are cu custom, special purpose applications or devices. They're only doing one thing their entire life. If I gave you the set of requirements for what you're doing with the disk or the processor, it, you could pick intelligently how to manage it better. So that, I didn't answer the question. Oh, the other part of the skip, why there's a plug-in framework. We knew that every, the history says every operating system did one, then did a lot of work to get to two and four. 
Eight was another leap of faith. And then somewhere beyond that, the algorithm fell over and you needed another algorithm. So we really anticipated that on top of that, that we would have real-time research to come up with better algorithms along the way, or that were tailored for different situations. And actually, there is an architecture called the Tile where I think they actually already have 64 cores, but I don't know how useful each core is. So, I mean, they're going to get there. It's just a matter of time. So what's the API for an application? Suppose I want to use the uh, DNS. So how do I set deadlines and uh, how do I can you do monitoring, for example, that you make your deadlines within the application? Or okay, the deadline, the, um, the de when you're doing right monotonic scheduling, I'm trying to look for a piece of chalk, most embedded system okay. tasks. Okay. Look on the left. Okay. Ah. Most embedded tasks look like this. And there's some kind of blocking operation. So they sit their entire life waiting for something to happen, and then they do something. And that's all they do. So you press a key, I wake up, I process a key, I go to sleep, wait for the next thing. Oh, I see. The operation is actually, well, there's RTIMS, break monotonic in front of it, but it's really period and like 10. And so you would wake up every 10 milliseconds, and that would be it. That's how you set your loop. So it looks exactly like you were waiting on a message queue or a mutex or anything else. And suppose I have a, an algorithm that's, for example, quadratic something and I have to run it. That's the only thing I have to run uh, that I can run. Um, so is that a problem or? But remember you, you, if that would be the, if you're running it in the background to completion. See normally you do things that are time focused or in response to events in the system. So somebody pushes a button the door opens. So if you've got this long running algorithm in the background, it could just run in the background. Or you know that, um, let's say, this wakes up and then it processes it as a scan code. You know how long that algorithm takes to run. Or if it, and when it gets a whole key event, it might send it to something that's more intelligent. Oops. trying to come up with a good example because like, you gave me a broad one and I'm trying to come back with a good example. In a, in another example, there are a lot of applications like video processing that do things, um, pipeline processing. So you do one codec and then another codec and another codec. So you could run each codec as a thread on a frame and you could run it on one frame, then pass the, a pointer to the frame to the next thread, the next thread to the next thread. And you could set it up. So rather than having an enormously long sequence of call this, call this, call this, that you don't know how long it's going to take, you can tune out the algorithms into separate threads, and then on a, on a SMP system, naturally those threads would run on different cores once you've got a few frames in. Because you would, you know, you'd, you'd start off with one here, frame one here, then frame one would be here, and you'd be doing frame two. And so by naturally breaking it into threads, you would naturally be able to take advantage of all the processing power, and the cool thing about that is you could um, break the chain of processing and insert another codec. So a lot of like signal processing algorithms are done, or signal processing systems are done that way. You know, you filter the data, then you do this with it, then you do that with it, then you do this with it. If you come up with a better algorithm along the way, you replace it. So the goal is not is you try not to have the big monstrous thing. You have very discrete things. You understand what they do and but it's, it's the classic small is better because you break into things you understand. You can put timing constraints on. So he, this task wakes up, does something, possibly transforms some data, does some computations, but there's a finite amount on what it can do. And, and by, based on this period, he would do something like this. At time zero, and then he would be scheduled at 10 and 20. And depending on whether he was 
the, high, the first time he might run all of this and then wait until here. But he might not be the most important thing. We, even though he was ready to run, he, would, he might run here, but, and, but he would be ready again. He's ready there. So his deadline is that he completes by the end of the, the deadline, not that he starts on the deadline. So that's the way the rate monotonic algorithm works. The rate monotonic algorithm actually was developed for the Apollo program. It's that old. So it's um, did I beat that, or did I just go all the way around it? And not no, 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 no. So, but how do you tune this? So, if you you have a specific architecture, you, you install RTMS on it, and you think, okay, this should be fast enough, and it turns out not to be. Or the thing I've done, the thing you do, if you if you can, a lot of these systems really are periodic because you're dealing with events in the real world that happen with frequency or a maximum frequency. So, what you do, this math really helps you. You're running every ten. So here he took two. This time he took 1.5. Well, what happened if this time he took five? If you find out that this 10, 10, 10 millisecond task is averaging seven, right off the bat, you can know that he's taking 70% of your CPU. So he is the place to optimize. So normally what I see by doing things period and focusing on the things that are naturally periodic, it's so easy to compute how much they're using that you don't look at the things that you're worried about. The other thing you get with our stats is you get minimum, maximum, and average on CPU and wall. So, and wall time is, you know, calendar time. So you might be using, this is a good example. We, I had a system that actually was a, had a max of 1.5 and it was a 10 millisecond task. But occasionally, it was taking 15 milliseconds of wall time. So it's never executing very long, but sometimes it's taking too long to do it. And it was the highest priority task in the system. And that means that a low priority task is holding a resource that it needed. And in this case, it turned out that an op a fairly benign, obvious mistake in a design pattern had been made, and it was that the data logger woke up and read all the data and locked all the data he wanted. And this task was the task that woke up and updated the data. So every now and again, the guy who updated the data would wake up while it was being logged and couldn't, uh, couldn't update the data until the logging was done. So what we ended up turning this task system around and doing was Everybody wrote newest data to the logger so the logger could run independent of everyone. And it was, I mean, and it's pretty obvious you want everybody to lock the data so what makes sense for the logger to wake up and go gather it, right? Well, it also led to a priority inversion problem, which if you look, uh, let's see, which was the Mars rover for Curiosity? Spirit? But the, the one before it had a horrible priority inversion problem that had to be fixed it on, on the ground. And it's a pretty famous one now. On I can't ground, believe... Mm, on the ground there. On the ground there. They did a code upload. Yeah, on the ground. On, yeah, on the Mars. It was on Mars when it happened. These are easy to do because they're not obvious. It's and, and it's not that people doing the system are stupid. It's that we did it exactly like you were supposed to. We locked the data every time it was accessed or updated. We just happened to get the priorities of the tech. We got the accent. We got the accessor pattern wrong. So nobody said these were easy. This is multi-threaded. That's why we get the big bucks, right? <laughs> that's from that system in, in uh, my class slides because I think that's a real example, and it's and it's also a hint that in the U.S. we say sometimes you want, you look for you're always looking for horses, but sometimes there's a zebra. So when you see the zebra, you need to find out why it's there. And this was a zebra. This, this task was running perfectly, except once in a while, and it was this. And so, keep, keep going. I got, I got nowhere to be except door bike, and I'm going to get there anyway. Maybe this is a stupid question, but do you sometimes uh, bake uh, your operating system into the hardware as well? 
the most I've ever seen anybody do was a research project where they actually, I don't remember if he's finished this or not, he, he was implementing actually a scheduler using the plug-in with a v FPGA assistant. So that's an interesting thing to do. That actually had been done with Ada uh, in the early 90s, and it, it's kind of painful, I think. It's better with FPGAs, but it's kind of a, it's hard. Normally, it's just part of linked in with the application and shift around the application, so you don't know it's there. And we don't know it's there. With Linux systems, you often uh, discover at one point that you just can't meet some deadlines. And that's where usually then you start adding hardware, uh, buffers, or whatever. I guess that this happens less, or? Uh, if, if it happens, it'll, it'll either be a horrible design problem early on, or it'll be something where things have been added to the system. And at that point, the, the priorities are really supposed to reflect things you don't need to do. So by being completely priority-based, you're supposed to avoid these problems. The other thing is the rate monotonic scheduling algorithm. One of the um, rules is called the processor utilization rule. And um, I think the limit for the formula is like 67%. So in, to use that rule by math, you can never have over 67% utilization for periodic tasks. But there's another rule called first deadline rule where you can basically draw out a timeline and you can get a lot higher. But you can also, I've, I've got an example in my class slides where it gets high enough where if you actually had this and saw this on a system, you would probably stop the project until you fix the problem because you, it's like within a, a few percentage points of being complete overload. Because that's the problem with all these. If, if you, you start wondering how accurate are my measurements, and if I'm reading 90% utilization and I haven't fielded the system, you know, you start getting nervous very rapidly. But these systems are supposed to survive and not fail. The other thing which, I mean, we focus on the scheduling. We actually do um, instruction level test coverage and we have near 100% generated assembly test coverage. Did that sink in? We have tests which execute nearly every instruction of generated code in the threading and synchronization and about 97, 98% of the branch paths. So if you looked at each branch instruction as taken, not taken, I think in the core set of the OS, I think the number is 1,980, and it's like 97% of those. You know, you've got taken or not taken, and we hit 97% of those. And that's been an ongoing Google Summer of Code project and high school student project and whatever. Anybody, anytime anybody wants to do something, there's always some test coverage to improve. And we've actually instead, it, the numbers aren't as high across all of the support code, but a lot of the support code is also near 100%. Uh, we've recently added the file systems into the set and that dropped. We have what we call the core number and the full number. The full number dropped into the mid 80s, but it, the amount of binary code analyzed went from 75K to like 275K. So dropping 12% probably wasn't bad considering how much code we had. Because basically we just said, we're gonna start having to add a lot of test code to file systems, which is pretty hard to do. And all that testing is automated. Um, most, except for some, a couple of commercial simulators for the space processors, all of it's reproducible on open source, uh, complete open source. Let's do two more. Okay. Or you just run your hands through your fingers? Hey. Fingers through your, not your hands through your fingers, your fingers through your hair. <laughs> yeah. about, uh, you, for the code in your system, if you didn't write yourself, or put this way, code that was written that you wanted to import without any real time constraints, if you go to your mind, and you never met, modify it, how on earth can you do that? You should let, let it look by itself with its own constraints. So the most you can do, kind of <coughs> the most you can do, we generally do try to define the resources we use. The network stack, actually, that's an interesting one because um, Wind River, someone told us their network stack actually uses mallet. So it actually can call the system mallet on the fly. But the, we're using the BSD stack. The BSD stack pre-allocates everything. So the other general rule of these systems, which that should have brought, I should have already said, everything is mallet, no dynamic memory allocations. 
that. So if um, once the application reaches a, a point where it's set, set to be initialized, you do not dynamically allocate memory because you, if you do that, you can leak, and if you leak, you can die, you, you can fail. So but we try to, when we bring in code to define the memory the requirements for it, and normally they run inside of threads, so you have control over them running inside of the threads, so you still have the priority. So like the shell normally runs at a fairly low priority. So if you run DD to a large disk, it's running in the background. How do you, uh, when you send, a, you mentioned processors in space and that they get hardened? Yeah. Uh, and uh, you mentioned that they have very small memory and stuff like that. Is the problem actually size or weight or is it a price problem? It's, when I said process problem, I meant manufacturing process. Yes. Because once the lithography drops to a certain level, the there is less higher, this is not my area of expertise, there's a higher probability of a cosmic ray hitting the actual circuit than when, like an older circuit um, where the lithography is larger. A lot of the cosmic rays pass right through without hitting anything. So the other problem is there um, are also, some of the power PCs are used because they have static core designs versus dynamic, which is again outside my area of expertise. But apparently whatever a static core design is, but they the process to make it resistant to the radiation and the heat makes the speed lower. And there's also, there is a size, weight, and power on a satellite, and everything is expensive. I had a Canadian guy tell me that they had to come under their memory budget because adding a memory chip was 100 grand to their satellite. So it's numbers like that where, you know, it, that would, it, and they didn't have a socket. I mean, this is all has to survive launch and shock and all those things. So it's a different kind of world. And you only build normally two. You build one for the air and one for the ground to debug on. And the one for the ground is often called a flat set. It's laid out in a lab with the boards laid out in them. It's a different, it's, it's a strange world. <laughs> Good night to end up. Well, thank you very much.